and welcome to HistFest 2021. My name's Rebecca Adil and I'm the director of HistFest. I'm so thankful for you all for joining us this weekend and I can hardly believe that it's nearly over. Do check out future HistFest events via the website, which is www.histfest.org. For those of you joining us just for this event, there are a couple of housekeeping points to note. Using the menu above, you can provide feedback on the event and also um, donate to the British Library, should you wish. The Library is a charity and your support really does help to open up a world of inspiration and learning to everyone. Um, your feedback is also incredibly important in helping the Library to plan future cultural events. You can find a tab on the menu to the bookshop um, where you can browse a range of titles from all of the festivals, authors and speakers. Below the video, just to remind you, there are social media links there should you wish to continue the conversation on other platforms after the event. If you're doing this, please do use the hashtag HistFest2021. Now, without further ado, I am really, really excited to introduce this next event. Black Tudors, Activists and Midwives. When historical fact meets historical fiction, we have a huge panel for this session. So I will list them for you now. The panelists include academic, novelist and founder of the Jalak Prize, Dr. Sunny Singh. She's also the author of the fantastic Hotel Arcadia. We have the author and screenwriter, Catherine Johnson, who has written award-winning books such as Freedom. And she's also the screenwriter of an adaptation of Black Tudors. We're also joined by historian and historical consultant Dr Jacqueline Riding, whose works include Peterloo and the Jacobites and the film version of Peterloo with Mike Lee. Um, we're also joined by journalist, stage and screenwriter Juliet Jilts Romero, whose latest plays are The Whip and an adaptation of the story of Medea. And Last but not least, the actor and author and science communicator Stephen McGann, who's most famous at the moment for starring in Call the Midwife. Enjoy! Hello and welcome. I am Sunny Singh and this is His Fest 2021. This is the session on Black Tudors, Activists and Midwives, when historical fact meets historical fiction. And I am delighted today to chair the session with some of my favorite people. Um, some I know and some I have just read. So very quick introductions. Catherine Johnson, award-winning author and screenwriter, uh, also writer of one of my favorite historical fiction books, um, The Curious Tale of Lady Caribou. Um, Jacqueline Riding, historian and art historian specializing in 18th century. Stephen McGann, uh, acclaimed actor. I'm not sure if Stephen needs an introduction, but um, nevertheless. Nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> and Juliet Jilks R R Romero, uh, a journalist and award-winning writer for stage and screen. Um, welcome everyone. I hope this will be a conversation and it will be free flowing. So, um, I will just start with a few questions and hopefully we can just pick up and go with it. Now, um, of course, history and historical fiction, we are we're in big times right now, you know, these are contentious, contentious times, or more so than usual. Mm -hmm. And Catherine, I think I wanted to start with you partly because um, Black Tudors has so much buzz around it, and yet it's walking that very fine line with, with the sort of anger and fury about rewriting history and um you know how you know how could we re whitewash it or is it the other way around i don't know anymore but tell us about it um tell us um what that process has been because it's history it's historical fiction and now it's an adaptation well yeah i mean it's miranda kaufman's book she wrote a book uh, called black Tudors, and what we've done with the uh, drama, it, it's for TV. It's like, you know, it is the difference between Orange Juice and Sunny Delight. I am not a historian. I'm looking, we've sort of milked and pulled a drama around. So we've taken some of the characters and sort of made them bigger and given them stories. But what Miranda book does is absolutely, un without qualification says, there have been all sorts of people here 
and at this time. I mean, what's difficult is that before industrial slavery, very often if you were wealthy, people did not mention your color, your ethnicity was secondary. Um, that was a difference. Uh, that's what's been fantastic, actually. Just exploring ideas about difference before there was industrial slavery, which codified uh, how you thought about otherness in that way, because it was a commercial thing. It's about how can we make money? How can we other this entire group of people in order to exploit them? And this happens before. And in fact, in our period, slavery exists in parts of the world, but it's like an equal opportunity thing, you know? Um, so it's not the difference in being black was not about being lesser. I mean, they had ideas about purity and goodness, but that wasn't a blanket thing. It wasn't a all black people are this. Or, well, they hadn't even started thinking about themselves as white at that time. That, was not, that didn't come for another 150, 200 years. So it was not, it, it's completely different. And that's been interesting. The stories, everyone, you know, stories, we all have stories. There are stories in every period of stories about, every, you know, it's not, that's not the unusual thing. The unusual thing has been exploring a world before industrial slavery and that the sort of racism that we have today. So, I mean, it's still not, it's still, you know, whether or not it will get made, we, we have to see, but, um, it, it was a real absolute joy and privilege for me. My period that I know most about is the 18th century, but I am not a historian. So I had to learn, I had to, you know, and what, one thing's fascinating, sorry, I will shut up soon. And where we pick, put our story was at the, in 1600, the Moroccan ambassador came to London to make an alliance invited by Elizabeth I and her government because England was isolated from Europe because of the Catholicism Protestant thing. So England had no powerful friends. This is before, you know, England hadn't come up. Yes, they'd beaten the Spanish in the Armada, but it was all still a bit touch and go. Spain was the big power. And England, a Christian country, came this close to making an alliance with a Muslim country, which was unbelievable. This was it was incredible the the moroccan uh, delegation you know that arrived in in tower hill and rode up the strand everybody you know 3 years later shakespeare wrote othello it was it it was an incredible time so it's been exciting and that's thank you catherine because it nicely leads me to i promise this we haven't we haven't practiced it but it nicely leads me to the question that i want for everyone here where everyone's been part of these amazing projects and adaptations and 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 um productions and that approach history and and historical fiction i suppose in some ways um in these really bold different ways these are not the period dramas that i have to say i, I have I no longer have the ability to watch yet another Jane Austen adaptation with Pretty Frocks. I am very sorry. Um, cancel me. But but you've all done these amazing things. And Catherine, you just kind of hinted at it. How difficult is it to get these off the grounds? How difficult is it to get it made? What are some of the things that people come up with and say? Um, uh, what are some of the, the blockages then? Well, because I'm the writer, I haven't been dealing with, I've been working with a fantastic company, Silverprint, who I must say have been, I'm an old cynic. I've been a writer for m m half my life, more than half my life. I'm very old. And they are the first company that have been so supportive in this. Unbelievably so. So I have been removed from all that um but it's happening i mean you look it, it is happening more i think people are looking in the wider world they're looking for a way to tell these stories 
again to give the because we there seems to be an insatiable appetite for in this country Tudors, Victorians, and Jane Austen. And uh, you know, we so maybe it's a way of telling these stories to ourselves about ourselves. And obviously, history is like science fiction in that science fiction is a way of looking at now. And historical fiction is always dependent on when it is produced. It's now. We're just looking at now in different frocks, whatever people say. So I think maybe that's part of it. I don't know. If I can just say about television, certainly, and in production, because I've also been involved in the production side before, and just echoing what, what Catherine's saying generally about um, the challenges, that you can be removed from the challenges in certain artistic sides, but the basic things are still the same and not often thought about. But firstly, history drama is very expensive. It generally is a lot. So there's a budgeting constraint. If you have um, a national broadcaster like the BBC now, I mean, per hour, it's going to cost a lot more if you are all in frocks than, than if, you're, if you are just in a contemporary police drama. Then there's also a peculiar thing about fashions. You've, I've pitched things before where you can have an idea for something and through no fault of your own, you could have been developing this project and they did something they think is similar the year before or it didn't make money the year before now you can't control those things so those challenges those physical challenges of catching the sort of zeitgeist to make the right drama at the right time um, historical drama goes through fashions mm -hmm. remember the year of and everybody was complaining about and look there are the perennials like the, the endless Jane Austen's but there are also periods where it was apparently all bonnet drama. It was all this drama. It was all. But it, it, if you look closely, it actually changes fashion. And when Call the Midwife came along, it was nobody did modern history, post-war history as a period drama. So for a while, people wouldn't even count that because it was in the Downton world. It was in a world where you still dressed in this way and you still did things they did things like that. And um, and so there are challenges getting these things made and, and convincing people that all that money that they put they put to mm -hmm. is going to be a worthwhile reinterpretation. If thinking about things like Bridgerton, a, a worthwhile new take on some idea of history that will catch some wave that will be useful, you know, to them. And it does go through fashion. So you have to work within those fashions. I'm going to slightly defend Pretty Frocks because uh, Peter Lou, of course, is the period of Jane Austen. <laughs> and, um, you know, it starts at 1815 and then ends in 1819. But it's like Jane Austen on steroids or a parallel universe mm. where Jane Austen sort of exists. Uh, I suppose it comes in from a Jane Austen point of view. You've got the regent himself, you know, the prince regent comes in. But it's, but it's the same period, but it's in a way, I'd like to just highlight the fact that, you know, I think people might consider Peterloo to be a, just a different period of history to Jane Austen, but it's actually running in parallel. So it's sort of, um, so we did have Pretty Frocks, but then we also had the complete plethora, you know, the, the whole diversity of society from, as I say, the Prince Regent, the Prime Minister, you know, scenes in Parliament, right the way through the middle classes, the middling sort, which sort of Jane Austen deals with, or gentry and so on. And then right down to the two or through to the laboring and working class. Um, and all that had to be research, which is obviously it's not a normal Jane Austen drama because you do have the laboring and working class center, front and center of the entire piece. So they were elements of the period which really required some digging into mm -hmm. yeah. and also the period where women are radical and political which again was full square and center mm. uh in in the movie so uh so jane austen but not i think you and catherine make great sorry i just wanted to i think you and catherine make this same po point really well which is that i never cease to be amazed by by recency bias, by the, by the idea that people look back when, they, when we look at period drama, is we add so much of the present day to it and our own prejudices and things. And what you two have both done is teased out those remarkable, um, those, those hidden parts of real history within those periods. And you've brought them out. But people, when we started, even in a 50s drama, people will tell you 
what you're doing wrong. They will mm. tell you, no, no, the 50s wasn't, isn't like that. No, no, you can't, no. And one of the classic examples of that was, I suppose, when we first started, was um, the streets are too clean. They're, 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 we don't like the streets. What are the streets? There's nothing on the streets. What all this sanitized working classes? And actually, there's a very interesting, I think, class point. We were being criticized by, by people because the working class didn't look working class enough i.e. they didn't look dirty. They mm. didn't, the streets didn't look dirty enough. Now, if you go and look at photographs of the 50s, of course, and what the reply was, well, what's the litter in the 50s? Tell mm. me about the litter. Are they McDonald's packets? Are they, what's, and actually what you see in 50s photographs is clean streets because they had a lot more workmen doing them and they had just less junk that we have. So that's a tiny example. But what, but the point I wanted to make about that was people would look back and would tell you ordinary people in the street would say, no, 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 that's not. And it's their idea and spin of history that then gets warped. And you two, certainly for me, when I'm a, why I'm a fan, is you two are teasing out these real parts of history and giving it the variety it deserves. But sometimes the prejudices of not only the public, but the TV companies as well, will lay over that. Oh, of course, of course, yeah. 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 You know? There's definitely I want to bring Juliet in, I think. Sorry, sorry, Jacqueline, I keep, keep trying to bring it, you know. Um, partly because I think you've made some really interesting points Stephen, about um, the recency of, it, of things and how we see recent history. But Julian, the Windrush Chronicles, I think it just, I mean, you know, that is, that is not just history, that is lived and living history in so many ways. I mean, we are, we are still living through that awful scandal. And, and I want you to tell me about how, or tell us all about this, this, what happens when you write something. Um, I produce, I mean, what happens with something that is so contentious, it's recent history, it's ongoing history and legacy and living legacy and history. Well, my background's in journalism. I spent close to 19 years as a, a senior reporter and, um, and, and producer. So I'm all about, I love news and current affairs and I love research. And I believe that in order to kind of like attack these, these subjects, which for some people, you know, that they, because they don't know about it, they've not read it in the history book, they might feel uncomfortable with the presentation of this material. You have to have tent poles, if you like. So um, for example, the, the, the whip, um, which is about the, the, the behind the scenes battle for abolition in 1833. I knew that I needed to get hold of the, um, to, you know, the freedom of information about the fact that we were all paying off this massive compensation um, amount paid to slave owners in 1833, the modern equivalent being 20 billion. Everybody working up until 2015, mm paid off that amount, which was 40% of the annual budget in 1833. Mm -hmm. You know, this is information that you will not find in, 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 in school books. And people can get very offended by this. Um, so, and I also went to the, the House of Commons Library. I read Hansard from 1833 to 1834, not only to get a real grasp of the time and the language, but to make sure that you know, the, the, the drama was, was, was fact-based. I had to fictionalise my characters, and it is a fine balancing act. You know, I have a character, Lord Maybourne, he's based on Lord Melbourne. We've seen the controversy with, um, I think it was a TV series, you know, Queen Victoria about his alleged relationship with, with, with her. And I didn't want any of that kind of snark around what I felt was an important storytelling. It also combines the history of the mills and the way that the English working class were enslaved in 1833. So the play is about the collision of the Reform Act, you know, allowing working men to, to be able to, to vote, um, reducing the hours of children's in mills. So I went to Quarry Bank Mill um, and also abolition, and I got hold of the actual Abolition Act and then discovered that slaves were then required to work for up to seven years 
unpaid apprentices. Mm. All of this is material that is not in or the public domain, you know, unless you research and, and dig. It's, it's not in the school curriculum. So, you know, you can get pushback. It's, it's a journey of education. And I do like to approach a subject from a point of not knowing, because then I think I can take an audience along with me. Another drama I did, which was for, for um, was a Radio 4 drama, was about the riots of 1919. Um, the piece was called One Hot Summer demobilized black veterans were attacked in the streets. This happened it, and it was mirrored in the United States, May, June, 1919. You know, black businesses were set a, a light. It started in Liverpool and, and spread around the country. You will not read this <laughs> in, in any school text. What I had to do was go to the British newspaper library get hold of the, the, the reportage starting in Liverpool with all those newspapers and national newspapers. And then I interwove um, factual reportage with my fictionalized characters. Because again, where the journalism comes in, I, you know, I am very keen to defend anything that I write. So I will establish the facts first, that the, the, those, those tent poles, um, and then, you know, create drama to, 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 to draw an audience in so that they can experience the reanimation of, of the past. And if I may, I'm just going to use one more example, which I absolutely love, and it's from Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall. There is a scene between Henry VIII and Cromwell. Henry VIII is having this dreadful nightmare about his, his brother. He's married his, his brother's wife, Catherine, and, you know, he wants, and, and, and he's desperate to know why he's, he's remembering his brother at this particular point in his reign, because his brother is dead, and Cromwell is invited into his chambers and has to calm him down, mm -hmm. um, and he touches his shoulder and crosses a line. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, that's the beginning of the end of, 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 of Cromwell. But what I love about the scene is that you know, the, the, the book, the drama, TV series, play, it's all based on fact. But as writers, we have to get into the nooks and the crannies. Historical um, fiction is about the emotional journeys of our characters placed within the context of mm. historical fact. Yeah. And it is a tightrope mm. and people will come for you. Particularly yeah. if they don't know what you're talking about. Mm. But I believe that we have the right to allow this generation and future generations to re-examine the past. And drama, TV, theatre, film, I think, is the most compelling way to do it. No, I, I, I agree. I, I, the, I, the thing about the riots in 1919, which were mirrored, in fact, by riots in 1947, um, in Liverpool as well, <laughs> which my father was actually in. It was one of the reasons you know, he, he'd just come over and um, uh, pre-Windrush, but the same thing. And and it was it was some, one of the most frightening periods of his life. But that thing about you know my people like me uh, and the future generations, we are. I mean, I I am English. I'm an English person. This is my history. This is my children's history. Yeah. And it, it is not just, oh, it's not just black history, it's everybody's history. Yeah. And I think this is really important. Yeah. I'm writing British history. And also, Sunny, you asked me about Windrush. So I was very proud to be involved in the Windrush Chronicles series. And I wrote about the Deptford fire. Uh -huh. um, 13 young black kids were died, um, despite um, men being seen jumping out of an Austin princess car and lobbing um, what looked like petrol bombs at the building. The kids were blamed um, for this. And when I wrote it, a lot of people, they, they thanked me for it and, but because they didn't know the history. This was 1981, it's not that, that long ago. This was shocking to me, but also it's, it's galvanizing to be able to bring a story like that because you know, it led to the largest or rather the most contemporary black march from Deptford to Hyde Park. Thousands, 
bust in from across the country to take part in that because we had no black MPs at the time. We had no political representation and the politicians were not talking about the, the children who died in that fire. Several months later, we then had the, 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 the Brixton riots which spread around the country. And then by 87, we had the election which brought in our first black MPs. But a lot of that political will came out of the fact that we were not represented and our voice and our stories were not being told. Can I go back to something that, pick up on something that Juliet has said? Because I think what connects everything that we're doing, whether we're doing a drama or um, TV film, or indeed writing a history book, which would deem to be sort of more traditional history, is storytelling, and that's, that's the key to it. And as a historian and art historian who has written books of history and art history, I learned a massive amount about storytelling from working with Mike Lee in particular. Yeah. So I worked on Mr. Turner and then straight into Peter Lou. And, and I think that's what unites all of it. And I think that as a historian, I would beg my fellow historians um, to not be sniffy about you know, the so-called you know, uh, authenticity or not of drama, uh, TV, film, and so on, but to tune into what's great, always great about it, which is the storytelling. It's about character, dialogue, narrative, et cetera, et cetera. Historians who do exactly that can learn a lot about the way that dramatists, um, historical fiction authors and so on, actually you know, move the narrative on. You know, to an extent, even historians edit history because you can't cover everything. Um, so you pick and choose your cast, which is how I now view it. I choose my cast. Um, you know, you get bang for your buck with a particular individual who appears in various places like this book I'm writing at the moment on, on Hogarth, William Hogarth biography. I haven't talked about all the people he's ever met. I've got a, a reduced cast and I've created a narrative, my narrative of Hogarth's life. Now it's not gonna be everyone's narrative of Hogarth's life. I'm rather hoping somebody somewhere, big hint, might transfer it to a, a sort of TV or film. But, but in a way that's, that's, that's my experience has been working with Mike and other directors and writers and professionals in TV and film and so on. And I've picked up little tips for how I can do my, my other day job, which is as, a, as an author of history and art history. So I just wanted to register that. Authenticity is great, yeah. but if you haven't got good characters, good dialogue and good narrative, you know, it doesn't yeah. matter what you're producing. I personally, I switch off. So I'm to, to add a fan letter to you all for that. I mean, basically, I think that, I'm optimistic when, when I come in my, in my sort of, in, from the lovey world and when, when we see the other side of it, the consultants like yourself, Jeff, actually the historians I talk to in the right, is, is you get it, then that actually, a lot of you out there are doing great work and you, you get onto set and you understand those distinctions. And good scientists too do consulting on the scientific aspects of drama. Mm -hmm. They can do science fiction films, but they get it. They get what the demands of storytelling are. So, so I'm more optimistic. I think some historians don't and some people working in the ivory towers don't, but a lot of people really do. Yeah. And, and just to pick up on your other point very quickly is, is that I myself before, when I've written about this, I'm fascinated by this authenticity thing. And um, I make a distinction um, between what I, what I would call accuracy and authenticity. Mm -hmm. I think you need a minimum and sufficient degree of accuracy, historical accuracy, clinical accuracy if you're making a medical drama. Beyond that, as a starting point, the rest is, I think the word you used is authenticity. And so you create the narrative world which feels authentic, which is authentic enough, which people can feel happy that they have enough fact or ten poles, as you called it before, Juliet, where they know they've got enough. And then they're OK with suspension of disbelief. They're OK being taken to a world which might have imagination in it. That's OK. That's good for history. That's good for drama. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that guys like you working in that world are doing a fantastic job, I have to say.
I think Mike <laughs> famously says that it, this is a movie, not a documentary. So that's, he, that summarises exactly what you've just said. Yeah. Look, just to, to um, I mean, we, you know, as dramatists, we're in the business of understanding the extremes of human behaviour. Mm. And that's why we do, you know, once we have our temples, we then have to stray within, you know, from certain boundaries to be able to bring an audience with us. The first play that I wrote um, at the gates of Gaza, which was about the British West Indies Regiment fighting in what was Palestine, read like a panorama mm -hmm. um, script. And I had to learn, you know, and that, that was the, 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 the wonderful journey for me as a writer. I had to learn about character and how character drives plot. And mm -hmm. it's been a fantastic journey. So I'm very character driven, which is, which as it is, as it should be. Um, mm -hmm. I was very overwhelmed by the history I was researching at the time. And I think that's why I kind of ended up with something quite dry. I mean, I went to the Imperial War Museum. I was reading the diaries of men who died in the field. And it, it was, as I said, it, it, it was overwhelming, but there comes a point where the dramatist has to have the courage to absorb all of that and then just have the freedom to reimagine and also write from a point of, well, for me, sometimes it's, 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 it's rage. I used to get very frustrated by the fact that everyone knows about Anzacs, everyone knows about the Australians who fought in the First World War, the New Zealanders, and yet we have, you know, black men from the Caribbean and from Africa whose histories are ignored. Mm. They weren't allowed to march in the victory parades after the First World War. So people were wondering, what are they doing in, in the country? So I get very upset about these things. It's like, it's like a, a complete erasure. And again, this is why as dramatists, we offer the opportunity to re-examine and to have to, to look with fresh eyes at the past because it informs our present. Can I, can I say, bring in Catherine? Yeah, can I say something? I think for me, what's most important is to make history and the idea of history accessible. You, you know, I have no qualifications. I don't, I, you know, I didn't even, I don't even have a GCSE or an O level because I was so rubbish. And it's not that, it's about making these stories accessible to as many people as possible. I mean, I come from a background for writing for young people as well. And, and I think that the best drama does really difficult, interesting, deep stuff, but in a way that everybody can access. So I think that's important. It's not history isn't this. It's not it's not for, it's for everyone. It's not just for people who are used to reading very dense books, although I do like books. But yeah. it's it's about not dense ones. Stories. Yeah, not dense. <laughs> not accessible. <laughs> and especially if they land on your foot. <laughs> <laughs> I just want, I wanted again to go back to something that Juliet said and, and Catherine and, and Stephen have, have, have covered it to an extent. I, just as, as a historian, you know, um, I, I think the importance is that you read that dense book, Catherine, Stephen, and um, Juliet, um, and then therefore you're in a position of knowledge. Mm. And then it's up to you what you do with it, you know, because you're the creatives. You're, the, you know, this is again what I learned at the knee of the master, uh, Mike Lee, is that my job on set or during rehearsals or in the improvisations is to give him, as far as we know, the information, what actually happened or may have happened in 1819 on St. Peter's Field, etc. And Mike says, thank you very much. That's great. I'm now going to do something completely different, but at least I know what did happen or may have happened. So he makes a creative decision based on knowledge. Yeah. And that's where the historians, that's why we're there. We're yeah. there to assist and to hopefully inspire but also just to stand back and go, your job, it's over to you. I I I'll have, I've done I'll, my bit. <laughs> I'll have that as my motto, creative decisions based on knowledge. Yeah. Thank you. And also I'm I think it's collaborative. To... I'm sorry. I, I think what you do is collaborative too. I think it's oh. wonderful. At its best, sometimes I know I've watched directors turning to, to, to people like you and say, look, okay, we want to achieve this. How would they have done to give me the answers, not simply so I can either choose them or discard them as something else, but enable me to make this beat of drama work. So if we can't make it work in this way, because that didn't actually happen like that, mm. if, if I, you know, when we work, I'm watching those collaborations sometimes become something real. 
but involving stakeholder people in history, like in my sort of modern historical drama, you bring stakeholders in from the time and say, no, what names did they used to use? How did they used to do this? Okay, we can't do it like that. You guys know, so work with us, walk alongside us and work and, and then you will often find something even better because, and it's based on a real historical um, framework, but it was different to what you maybe originally set out to do, but it works beautifully because it fulfills those needs of drama as well. I think that particularly works with something like language, because, you know, my, my Bible, when I'm on set and with talk, going through the dialogue, because as you know, with Mike, it's improvised and then honed and, and mm -hmm. sort of uh, sharpened and so on, on, as you're doing the improvisations. Mm -hmm. My Bible is the Oxford English Dictionary. Uh, because sometimes you can get a gem of a word that actually has a kind of correspondence to modern language, but allows you to, at that point, root it in the period, but will be understandable mm -hmm. to the audience. Um, my favourite one was bull scutter, uh, which um, is a Lancastrian dialect word. This is for Peter Lou. If you watch it again, watch out for bull scutter. Originally, obviously, the, the actress said another word. Um, and I said, I don't think we can use that word, but I'll try and find you something that's more accurate or closer to the period, to the dialect. And lo and behold, there was bull scutter. It just means rubbish. It doesn't mean, mm. you know, what you think it might mean. But the audience will listen and think, it, I know what she's talking about, I think, uh, but it's an authentic word. Do you see what I mean? So it's those little bits where history can enliven and add another layer and as Stephen says, it might even be the inspiration. It might be the answer to something that everyone's been searching for. Guess what? History might actually have the answer. But it's not always the case, but in other, in other circumstances, it certainly is. I, I'm going to pull out something from things that all of you have said, and I'm really fascinated by, uh, partly because I'm working on, a, on, on an idea that's going to walk, have to walk that fine line. Where, what are some of the ethical questions what are some of the boundaries because I think it's a really interesting one to think about how you know yes it's a creative decision um, based on knowledge as you said um, but are there ethical lines are there ethical ways of making that creative decision based on, on knowledge because of course a creative could as you said you know completely choose to ignore the knowledge um, and, you know, my, you know, my personal bugbear is very similar to Juliet's, you know, the fact that, you know, this country forgets that, no, it wasn't the English troops that won the Second World War. It wasn't even Britain that won, you know, the Second World War. Um, and, and so Falga, the Frasier really yeah, yeah. infuriates me. But, and yet you see, you know, these wonderful period dramas, massive levels of historians, very, very knowledgeable. Some of my favorite historians working on those productions as consultants, and then out comes the, the product and they've been entirely ignored by the creative. So mm. what are some of those lines? What are some of those, those, those issues that we need to be, maybe creatives need to be aware of, not so much as historians? I think I've been lucky with my creatives <laughs> so I can make that statement. <laughs> I've just, I feel quite horrified at the idea that you'd be ignored completely. It does beg the question, why did you bring the historians in in the first place? And there's all sorts of reasons for that, presumably, but um, I'll hand over to the creatives, but uh, yeah, I think I've been lucky. Mm. Um, do you want to go, Juliet? Sorry, you had your mouth around while I was going. <laughs> um, I, I was just uh, kind of like thinking loud. I mean, I think two things. One of the reasons why I work so hard at this is because as a black woman, you know, there is pushback about someone like myself apparently trampling over British history. Mm. Um, so I am, it's not just about being careful, it's about proving yeah. that I understand the history mm. um, and that it's indisputable. Yeah. Um, because as I said, you know, it's like, I, I'm, I'm now doing the, the, the kind of um, dramas that is traditionally in the um, sphere of, you know, white male writers mm. and people are uncomfortable with that. I, I, I really think that truth is important and we're living in a post-truth world and just listening to your 
question today, so I was kind of thinking about my mouth was slightly open, I think, was that there was a film, U571, I don't know whether um, people remember it, and it was about, so that the, um, these, these British submariners boarded this German U-boat led by this, this man, David Baum, and they captured the Enigma machine. Mm. Um, and turned the, the, the course of, 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 of the war, I mean, incredible bravery. And then Hollywood comes along and it does its own version, starring, I think, John Bon Jovi, um, <laughs> Matthew <laughs> Mahomahay, um, you know, and Har Harvey Keitel. And it's an American um, group of submariners who bought this, this boat. And of course, it's lavish drama that was made. And I was profoundly offended by this. Now, to an American audience, you know, they, 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 they probably don't really care. And for Hollywood, once it makes a lot of money, but I just think it's, it's wrong, you know, to so um, dismiss the historical fact of it. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if the writer, I should research this, if the writer was British or, or, or American, but personally, I don't think I could have stuck with a project like that because it's so untruthful. Yeah. In that instance, that's fiction, not historical fiction, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, history, I mean, where is the history? If you get that basic fact wrong yeah. or you've you know, decided to ignore it, it just, yeah, that, that feels, that's fiction. Yeah. There is a constant tension between what we would like to be out there and seen by as many people as possible and private enterprise and Hollywood and fine. And we cannot, I'm probably reasonably confident in saying that the gathered group here could probably not as individuals go out and finance our entire own series. <laughs> and the minute, whether you want to make a record, you find the minute you go out and you're asking for millions of pounds to make drama, there is a tension. There is a tension with the producers. There is a tension for the markets they wish to sell to. And we cannot ignore that. Now, I'm saying we cannot ignore that. I'm saying we should push on it. I'm saying that absolutely we should push through, aware that, that there will always be some form of pushback somewhere from some people who want, who, know, who have their own agendas for, for sales and and whatever. Um, it's always a problem. And I think that sometimes I've heard of people who've left productions because they've borne no relation to the original um, ideas. Mm -hmm. I've heard that time and time again, where they just go off at a tangent. And films particularly are very strange beasts. They take a long time to get made and they're, they're very strange. At least television has a sort of, especially in Britain, it has a kind of a a certain predictability mm. where you get a something green lit and you kind of it has a, a you know a thing but still it as i said earlier it has tastes it has biases you know? I, I want to say something about eth the ethic thing I, which i know because i have turned down certain work because oh, I, it's the, it's also the difference between tv and books so it's really difficult i think if the uh protagonists if if the people who lived through it are still here yeah. and i'm talking i'm thinking about certain uh really important things in british history uh i think that's a massive responsibility for one writer and obviously it's, it's good that tv can deal with you know is a collaborative form film it's a collaborative mm -hmm. form but that can mean that things get lost because you are constantly aware that the, the, the amount of money things cost that the vision can get can change which it does and in some cases that's always for the better and the difference then with books when you book you have if you write a book obviously it's a much cheaper thing you can just write it but then, then there's another problem which if you write a book about somebody who is important in history but has massive flaws especially when you're writing for young people the pressure is on to present this person as, present their story as, oh, it's lovely. When you <laughs> want to say, actually, this person is incredibly problematic, mm. you know? And this is something, it's something that with one book at the moment, I'm struggling with a lot because this person is incredibly problematic. And there are so few Black Britons of note. Obviously, there are quite a lot that we know nothing about. But 
you know, and, and I think it's important that not, not everybody is just perfect. Yeah. And because there's this plethora of white people in history who are not perfect, there's a pressure to say, oh, yeah, but that person, because he existed, because we know about him, can you please knock the, the sides off? <laughs> I'd like to talk in response to that about, I don't know if you've seen Mr. Turner, but that was obviously a, a film about a, a, one of the greatest artists who's ever lived, as far as I'm concerned. But there was contradictions and problematic elements of his character, particularly in his relationship with women and the way he treated women. And that is in the, that's in part of the historical record. But try and tease that out of some of the biographies that I had to read before we uh, actually started working on it. You know, they, they were somewhat sort of pushed back or sort of laughed about and it's seduction, not, you know, and all this sort of thing. And that the language, the particular language around, the, in this instance, Turner and his his women and the way he um, removed his children from his will and stuff like that. And uh, so if you see Mr. Turner, mm -hmm. you know, his relationship with women is absolutely full square. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, there was very little information on the women and that all had to be teased out. And mm -hmm. and what little we had then had to be in a creative way formed into characters and, and narrative and, and so on and so forth. So there's an example of a, di a, a problem or a kind of contradiction between, you know, the sensitivity of the artist, of the, of the painter, mm. in the same body, having somebody who's very dismissive or might, might seem to, according to the historical record, might seem to, um, uh, you know, treat, be unsensitive to other human beings, uh, particularly women and so on. So... I think I'm particularly of the many things I'm proud of with Mr. Turner is the way that it took the warts and all it said, the contradictions, we can't explain them because guess what? There's human beings, we're contradictory. <laughs> and that's part of the joy of working on, as I say, working on William Hogarth, what a contradictory character he is. Um, and the contradictions is where the color, you know, the, 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 the life, liveliness of the life comes from. Otherwise it would be a very dull story. If, if they were all, as, as Catherine said, it all went nicely and sweetly and there was no trauma or problems in the character or difficulties or contradictions, which I think we've is just cool. We've just been given the five minute warning, but I wanted, Juliet, I wanted to bring you in partly for something that, that Catherine has um, started to um, bring up and this, this kind of a pressure, and I know I feel that, this, um, you know, when we're writing stories about people who aren't often written about, about groups of people, it's no longer just a character. Mm. It's in somehow, you know, there, there are many, many, many white characters and they can be good or bad and evil and, and often in the same piece of work. But when there's so few um, movies or books or TV series, um, in my case, about um, South Asians, you know, there's, there's a real, real need to kind of go, you know, should I be making them better? May, maybe I, you know, should they be nicer? You know, should they go, you know, clean? Do I, should I talk about the, the, the terrible stuff because I just want to write a character? What do you make of that, Juliet? How do you, how, what, how do you? I, I, I tied myself in knots. Um, in my first draft of At the Gates of Gaza because I was very uncomfortable accessing the, the, the extremes of behaviour of black men at war. And fortunately, you know, I was able to throw the research over my shoulder and just think, these are people, they're fascinating. And to, it's what I call the, the, the Sidney Poitier syndrome. Who He played wonderful, noble characters, mm. you know, but that had its place. You know, I think that we do need to, and I think Mr. Turner was, was superb, by the way, Jack. Mm. It, 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 it's about, you mm. know, accessing people from a 360 degree angle. And I think that's what I've learned as a dramatist. I don't feel the need to, just put people on a platform because you know of the, the history is 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 so noble. Um, I think that if you're going to carry an audience, they have to be able to walk in 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 the shoes of your characters, and they need to see their humanity at all peaks. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it was a real journey, you know. Um, I, I wanted to to 
to write this glorious piece about the British West Indies Regiment. And I had to forget that, you know, I was writing a piece about men at war. Yeah. And now I'm going to try and give you one last question for all of you. What's next? What's coming up? Give, give us a taster before we go. <laughs> Very quickly, 1966, Call the Midwife, out on TV next week. Um, England wins the World Cup, but Yay. underneath the surface, there is darkness as well as light. <laughs> okay, I'm doing something contemporary. I'm looking at criminal justice at the moment, but um, I also have two other historical projects, but I'm not allowed to talk about them at the moment. So watch this space. I'm doing an illustrated history uh, of the black presence with fiction and non-fiction. It's like it's going to be the sort of book I would have liked with nice pictures for Walker, for children, and I am doing a lot of other things. I've got, uh, well, I've mentioned it already, William Hogarth. It's Hogarth Life in Progress, which comes out on the 1st of July. Um, I'm working on a film about a boxer, uh, early, late 18th, early 19th century uh, pugilist, prize fighter. Um, and I've got another project which is about the criminal justice system in the 18th century, but I can't really talk about it. I'll read that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, um, thank you, all of you. Um, we could be here for a very long time. I, I, my list of questions is not even quarter way through. But um, thank you very much. This has been absolutely wonderful and enlightening and educational for me. I've got lots of ideas of what to, what to take to my own work. So um, thank you very much. Thank, thank um, you, Sunny. Thank you. Lovely, thank, you. Lovely to, thank you. Lovely to meet everybody. Yeah, definitely. Lovely to meet you all. Thank you. Thank you to you, our audience, for joining us today, and a special thanks to today's panellists as well. Please do remember to send feedback if you can, and also check out the British Library's What's On pages to see what other events are coming up. Please also check out HistFest's website as well, www.histfest.org. Thank you.